Hello. Our story begins over the planet of Genosis. The Jedi had claimed victory over the Separatist world and were preparing to return to Coruscant. Dooku escaped and it was clear that the Clone Wars had begun. There were some regrets, some hopes, and a lot of confusion. The future was clouded. Always in motion was the future. As the Jedi were shipped from the surface of the planet to the fleet above, a group of Genosan fighters strafed a bundle of LAATs. Inside of one of the many gunships shot down was Grand Master of the Jedi Order, Yoda. His ship was blown into a million pieces in a fiery blaze over the desert planet. As a result, Republic fighters dropped down towards the surface to rip through the Genosian ships. At the same time, clones would try and retrieve any potential wounded clones or Jedi. The result of this surprise attack would claim the lives of a couple dozen clones and that of Grandmaster Yoda. He didn't stand a chance, and with information slowly coming back to the rest of the council, they all realized that they had lost a great friend. It would be a long journey from Genosis to Coruscant, and throughout that trip through hyperspace, the Jedi would discuss their future. Many of the council members never expected Yoda to die during the invasion. It was bad enough that out of the 200 or so Jedi to go to Genosis, more than 75% of them had died in the combat and unfolded on the ground. The galaxy felt heavier and darker than ever before, and the addition of losing Yoda would only exaggerate those ill feelings. The council wouldn't make any sizable progress throughout their trip through hyperspace, and so they decided, with the guidance of Mace Windu, to suspend their conversation until they had time to reconvene in the council chambers. As Master of the Order, Windu was working as the Grand Master. It was part of the role, and why he was a magnificent Jedi as Master of the Order. He filled Yoda's shoes expertly, getting the Jedi dispatched back to the temple, holding the ceremony to memorialize their fallen, approaching the Chancellor and holding talks with him, and any number of other tasks that had to be completed at the beginning of the war. When all this was said and done, the Council would meet up at dusk. The benefit of the space between their initial talk and the current one is that each member had time to think about anything and everything that was said in hyperspace. Many of these Council members would take notes on their own thoughts and feelings regarding how they should replace Yoda. It wasn't just getting rid of him, but the Order was in need of a leader. Without a leader, what were they to do? Each member sat still in their seats, looking to their peers, to their elders, to their newest members. It was silent. No one wanted to say anything. How does one just replace Yoda? Before Anakin came to the temple, he was believed to be the Chosen One. Yoda had overseen dozens of generations of Jedi. He was there during the High Republic, and his death came at the beginning of yet another trying time in galactic history. The Order was reliant on a Jedi Master to guide them through such a strenuous time. However, there was only one Jedi who had served with Yoda on his council for over a century. That was Opa Rancisis, but he had no interest in leading the Order. Part of it was fear that he could never be as good as Yoda, and the other was that despite his complacency, he believed one of the younger members should guide this Order forward. He wouldn't be alive forever, and the death of Yoda, to him, was a sign that the times were changing. It was an era in which the old guard needed to step down and allow the newer generation to take their stand. Oppo therefore decided to speak first, informing his colleagues that the loss of Yoda was devastating, but the loss was a beginning of a difficult time for their order, one not seen since millennia before. If the Jedi did not adjust, then they would fall into obscurity. He therefore suggested that any master older than the age of 100 should be barred from partaking in the vote to become Grand Master. The other members agreed to this. They believed his judgment was rightly placed. Mace then added to it, suggesting that the role of Grand Master was a very important one. Mace believed the Force had called him to remain in the role of Master of the Order. It was where he was brought when he ascended into the Council. Therefore, he would be removing himself for any potential pool of Jedi that could become Grand Master. This was fair, it did narrow down their choices, and what followed would become a continuous back and forth. There weren't debates by any means, and most of the Jedi were too humble to ever suggest themselves. From next to Mace Windu sat a quiet Jedi Master, one who listened and quietly observed. He had his own beliefs, then being cemented in the thoughts that Depa Balaba would make a fine Grand Master. Perhaps not at this moment, but she was instructed by Mace Windu. Her ascension to the Council was just as impressive as Mace's and his own. Plo didn't really have anything specific to add to these discussions. He just listened and allowed everyone to speak their mind. As they continued their speaking, Mace asked Plo what his thoughts were on the matter, and he looked over, before back to the rest of his peers. Plo was always quiet for two main reasons. It was very admirable of him, but his master, Wookiee Jedi Taivoka, was a member of the Council. When he died, his dying wish was for Plo to ascend to the High Council. It was in 44 BBY, when Plo was still a Jedi Knight, but the Council obliged. Plo learned and listened for all the years leading up until this moment. 
He had recently trained Voltar Swan, and officially became a Jedi Master. He was quiet because he believed he had much more to learn before interjecting. In addition to that, Flo had no need to interject because he was a quiet person as it was. He spoke when he felt the desire to speak. Plo turned to his peers and said that he believed Master Balaba would make a fine Grand Master. She was surprised. Many of the Jedi were already leaning towards Kiare Mundi because he was able to remain true to the code despite being in a number of attachments just to keep his species alive. Everyone was surprised by Plo's suggestion, but he continued further. He pressed his fingers together and said that he believed the Jedi Order should claim neutrality with this new Grand Master. Plo then furthered his point, admitting that it would be impossible for the Order to be entirely neutral, but a system that allowed non-military Jedi to try and help the peace process while others could continue to serve could be beneficiary. Plo knew the Senate would never agree to losing their fighting force, so there was potential and a means to having both war and peace. Of course, war was against their code and their order as a whole, but if it was done for the right thing, then it had to be done. The Council looked around to each other. Had Master Yoda been here, he likely would have dismissed the idea. Having been Grand Master for so long, he was used to trusting politicians, seeing them as friends, when in reality, he was disconnecting himself from the galaxy that changed around him. Yoda's complacency stemmed from old age, but he was far too trusting of the Republic, which had become drastically more corrupt during his time as Grand Master. Because there was no one to immediately shut down Plo's idea, Mace Windu suggested that they should take Plo's idea and allow the coming Grand Master to take the plan and make a push for the Senate with it. The Council agreed, and then they placed their votes. Within minutes, they got the results, and Mace Windu stood up and walked to the center of the room. The Council voted on a two-third majority, so if it wasn't agreed upon initially, then they would restart the process again. As he stood, he looked at the numbers, seeing that Plo did continue his vote, placing it for Depa Balaba. Following that were two other votes. There was also one vote for Kiare Mundi, but the one who won was Master Plo Koon. He was more surprised than anyone else, and he was pushed to the high seat in the Jedi Order. He would be the lead in their most trying time, and it was his chance to leave a mark that wouldn't just define an era, but define the future of the Jedi Order. Though there was a benefit. Like Windu, he was young. He could relate more to his peers inside the Order, something that a 900-year-old Yoda couldn't do. The new Grand Master was really surprised by all of this, and he knew he would have to do a deep dive on how to properly handle this new honor. But first things were first, the bill he wanted to issue. Clone the Council would spend eons drafting it up before submitting it to the Galactic Senate itself. They decided, under the guidance of the new Grand Master, to avoid handing the decision over to Palpatine. There wasn't any distrust from at the moment, but it was more so the fact that the Jedi wanted the entire Senate to read the information at the same time. Depa Balaba and Eeth Koth would handle the proceedings inside the Senate, while the rest of the Jedi Order mobilized for war. Plo knew that this entire process with the Senate would be difficult, but to make sure he and Palpatine were on the same page, he held a rather boring talk with the Chancellor, just informing him that he was the new Grand Master and so forth. Palpatine played the formalities and such, but he realized that Plo would be an issue for him. As a result, Plo's fleet would be sent to track down an experimental Separatist weapon that had been rumored out in the galaxy. Plo would agree to follow the trail. Palpatine specifically didn't like that Plo was willing to scoot around him and go directly to the Senate. The fact that there were two council members inside the Senate building consistently now irked him even more. To add to those two was Caleb Doom, Depa's new student. The reality of the Senate's reaction to the bill proposed by the Jedi was they actually kind of liked it. Palpatine didn't, but he couldn't show that. Essentially, the Jedi pushed forward a new protocol. Being that most of their order wasn't full of warriors and they traditionally were peacekeepers, they wanted to serve both the Republic and the galaxy. This was also sent with Oparancesis to Raxus, so that the Separatist government could overlook it too. But with this bill, because the Jedi had already taken the side of the Republic, members could choose to fight or opt out of the war. If the Jedi individual chose to fight with the Republic, then to be excluded from the bill. Every other Jedi, therefore, would be treated like a citizen or Jedi. The Order specifically as a whole would claim neutrality in the war and work dedicatedly to bring forward the peacemaking process. There would also be a list provided to every government, one of which depicting which Jedi did and didn't opt to stay in the war. There was also a hidden brilliance to this plan. It was the fact that if the Republic and Separatists agreed to this, then it was proof that they could come together and end the war. Neither Senate saw the move at all, but that didn't matter. All that mattered was making sure they agreed to it. Plo believed they'd have a difficult time with the CIS because they were fighting against the Republic, but ironically, the Republic had more of an issue with it. 
the reason the Separatists didn't immediately reject it is because, aside from Dooku, they deducted that the collective order as a whole, for the most part, would elect to remove themselves from the war. With that belief, they then believed that it could be more beneficial to have a mediator between both sides when they tried bringing the peace. Plus, who cares if a couple loose cannon Jedi fought against them? It wouldn't make all that much difference on the battlefield anyways. Dooku was instructed to block the bill, which is what he did for as long as he could. The Republic Senate was in Palpatine's control, so there was no issue with him in regard to that. Palpatine was able to keep the bill away from passing for longer than the Jedi cared to notice, and because it was taking so long, the Jedi returned to the battlefront, all of them fighting with different legions or armies. Plo's first group would be ambushed by the malevolence outside the Abrogado system. The blow was intended to kill Plo, but it didn't do the job. The loss was devastating for him. He lost his entire army in the attack, but with the help of Skywalker, they were able to destroy the CIS super weapon. Because of the block inside the Separatist government, Mace Windu was dispatched to Raxus to try and negotiate a deal with Dooku. There was some serious history between them, and Windu wanted more than anything to end this war. He had recorded in his journal a number of times that he wished he could have killed Dooku on Genosis. He wanted this war to end, he wanted the peace to return, and now, despite claiming the moral high ground over the Jedi, Dooku was perpetuating a war. He was acting, ironically, more a hypocrite than his own master. That master could be either Sidious or Yoda. When Mace arrived, he was met with disgust. Oppo and Dooku hadn't gotten anywhere, and truthfully, Dooku was tempted to kill Master Rancesis. If Mace wasn't coming, then he would've. It was the price of being a Jedi. They all deserved to die, in Dooku's mind. He'd make sure that they met the fate they were destined for. Mace and Dooku would speak for hours, neither of them getting anywhere. Initially, the whole purpose of this was to end the war, and now it became evident to Mace that all Dooku wanted to do was prolong the situation. It felt like Dooku wanted the war to go on so that the Jedi would look worse. It was kind of working, too. Most of the details of the relations weren't being shared publicly. This was between the Republic, Jedi, and CIS. Of course, the news would spew out information, speculating on whether or not the Jedi might actually take the deal with either form of government. Sidious and Tyrannus were doing everything in their power to make sure the Jedi couldn't thwart their plans. However, the collective systems of governments saw the opportunity in this. The Jedi were essentially offering an out, and if they could get it done correctly, there'd be no need for this war. Many people after the war began started to question if it was really worthwhile. Now that the Jedi were heading an incentive to end it, there was no question in ending it. As the Jedi continued fronting these bills, they noted similarities between Dooku's and Palpatine's approach to the entire situation. Initially, the Jedi were willing to see Palpatine as a short-sighted elder politician that didn't want to lose his high commanding officers. But as the process furthered along, it seemed like there was another reason for it. Many people in the Senate were fronting the bill, trying to get it approved. But for both Palpatine and Dooku, their closest allies took the brunt of the heat for blocking the bill. The best part about this is both leaders didn't take the blame, and they avoided any political discourse that could disrupt their presence inside their governments. Because everything was going the way it was, the Jedi remained loyal to the Republic and continued serving alongside the clones. Plo would still assign Ahsoka to Anakin, and he would oversee military operations with his own troopers. But Plo's main focus was sending more reinforcements to Raxus and the Senate to try and push this bill into motion. Months would pass by without any progress. It was difficult for the new Grand Master. He was balancing the restructuring of not just the bill, but his entire military unit, most of the troopers being lost to the malevolence. Once the unit was reborn, he led it for a few weeks before returning to Coruscant. The process itself was grueling, and both he and Windu felt the brunt of it. They called for a ceasefire multiple times and yet nothing got done. Inside the walls of the council chambers, Plo believed that the Republic was slowly falling apart, and perhaps they had made the wrong decision when joining the war and siding with the Republic. Not that Dooku's regime was any better, but it wasn't this. The Republic was self-sabotaging. They were avoiding the end of the war itself, but there was a secret evil lurking behind him. Every Jedi could see it, and they resented it. War was profitable, not just for the leaders, but every politician, though there was a saving grace. Due to the lack of movement made by either side, Padme illegally snuck into the other side of the conflict and met with her friend, Mina Bontiri. The two of them were able to bring up a new idea and it was the end of the war itself. They found things that they were able to agree on, and they brought the treaties back to Coruscant. There was a backup plan involved with this. They both agreed that they needed to come up with a plan in case everything went belly up. Mina suggested that before they make a move for the peace treaty to be fronted, they force the bill on the Jedi to go through. 
It could be the saving grace for both sides. As was explained by Mina, is that the Separatist government was beginning to see Dooku as an asset that had run its course. There were whispers about an impeachment for him. Padme echoed the same ideas. The Senate was becoming tired of the back and forth on the Jedi Bill without it getting anywhere. What followed was another week of debates, and then all of a sudden, with the threat of impeachment and a vote of no confidence, both Dooku and Palpatine lessened their grip on the governments, allowing the Jedi Bill to be passed immediately. This was a step in the right direction, and it was one that the Sith would monitor heavily. The moment the bill was certified, the Jedi were sent transmissions. Each transmission contained a question air and a certification of place in the Clone Wars. With this, each Jedi could decide and announce to not just the Order, but the galaxy that they were staying in the war or leaving the war. The choices were very simple, but what became an issue for most Jedi is the fact that the warriors on the front lines had become very attached to their clones. So out of the 10,000 Jedi in the Order, about 1,000 of them stayed active in the war. It wasn't disappointing, Plo understood. He was just surprised. The Council expected 500 to 700 to stay in the war, but that was a fine number, they could live with this. There were some Council members who stayed present in the war too, but those who left the war and stood on the side of neutrality were Plo, Mace, Obi-Wan, Depa, Eeth, Shakti, and Opa Rancisis. Everyone else stayed active members. This was the beginning of the peace process. With both Grand Master and Master of the Order abandoning the war, it was clear to the public that the Order itself was ready to move into a time of peace, but the challenge of course was making it happen. Mace and Obi-Wan would be sent to Raxus to conduct peacemaking propositions with the Separatists, while Depa and Eeth Koth continued their work with the Senate. Anakin wouldn't be anywhere near this. His focus was conquest and victory, so his wife would be teaming up with other Jedi to help bring peace to fruition. Plo, on the other hand, would mediate, help in wherever he could. As Grand Master, he was supposed to be in the temple all the time, or at least that's what Yoda did, but he was considering the path of not doing that. In the middle of the peacemaking process, there was an attack on Mandalore, one led by Darth Maul and Savage. It had taken so long to get the peacemaking process that Maul was able to ally himself with the Death Watch and unite the crime families. But instead of one Obi-Wan Kenobi going undercover, an attack force of 200 Jedi, including Mace Windu and Kenobi, would go to Mandalore, rescue the Duchess, capture Almec, and fight Maul and Savage. The duel between Mace, Kenobi, Savage, and Maul would rock the Royal Palace. As this was happening, squads of Jedi were taking out insurgents, wiping out Mandalorians, criminals, and pirates in one swift strike. The sneak attack was aided by Bo-Katan and her allies. Because Mandalore was neutral territory, they were able to do this without disrupting the peacemaking process between the Republic and Separatists. Inside the throne room, Kenobi and Mace worked back to back, like they did on Genosis, fighting to take down another duo of Sith. Because everything had taken such a drastic turn, Sidious avoided going to Mandalore and rerouted to Coruscant. Obi-Wan and Mace kept on switching up their positioning, just to mess with Maul and Savage. The brothers were experienced, but they wouldn't be able to handle the might of two Jedi Masters. During one of these switch-ups, Maul would lose an arm, and then shortly after, his life, to Mace Windu. Following Maul's death, Savage would be cut down in a swift defensive move by Kenobi. The War of Mandalore concluded with the public being informed of something they honestly should have seen coming. They watched every criminal empire in the galaxy unite for no reason and then sweep into Mandalore for no reason, and didn't think it was a setup? Pre Vizsla and Almec were exposed for trying to throw Satine under a star cruiser. The Jedi were heralded in as heroes for helping liberate the planet, and Satine was able to reclaim her planet being that she was the one who got the Jedi to Mandalore in the first place. On the Separatist side of things, after the Mandalore conflict, the Jedi had noticed similarities in Dooku and Palpatine, so they started tracking their vessels. It wasn't something that would get them anywhere, but it felt like a necessary precaution. Sidious was fuming, but he planned to disrupt it. As the Republican CIS moved into peacemaking territory, the Coruscant power grid was bombed and an assassin would kill Mina Bandiri and almost kill Padme. Dooku and Palpatine believed they would disrupt everything faster. However, the Jedi found the corporate behind Mina's assassination, and it was a trail that led right back to Dooku. As for the bombing of the power grid, that was done because of Dooku as well. An intercepted transmission from Serena to Grievous' capital ship told them everything they needed to know. The Jedi suggested monitoring Dooku more, and the government quietly did so. It saved the Republic from taking the heat, and therefore, the CIS removed Dooku from power. But he wouldn't go quietly. Instead of accepting his loss, he would decide to try and kill every senator and take control like an emperor. What followed was a duel between Dooku and Mace Windu. He initially believed he'd have no issue dispatching the Jedi present on Sereno. Kenobi and Opa were defending the senators from Magna Guards and Commando Droids. It was a terrible event, 
but in the chaos of the Separatist chambers, Mace and Dooku engaged. This was a fight that had been building since Genosis. Dooku knew Windu's moves, and played off of it, but for Dooku, it was too late. He was too involved with the dark side of the Force, and he couldn't reject him. He knew how to defend from Windu, and he knew that Windu was extremely talented, especially against Darksiders, but he couldn't pull away from his own lure to the dark side. And so, in a last ditch attempt to avoid dying, Dooku told his longtime friend that they were brothers once, and in the midst of a duel, Windu fought himself, but he couldn't allow this to continue any further. So at the notions of being brothers once, he responded with one word, once. May stuck under a deceptive swing made by Dooku before slashing him across the chest and killing him instantly. When it was done, Mace fell to his knees next to his fallen Jedi friend. It was hard, but it was for the galaxy. The death of Dooku would signify the beginning of a Separatist movement focused solely on peace. The event pushed people willing to side with Dooku away from him. They saw him as Palpatine too, which really is what he was. However, the plot only thickened because Palpatine just lost his apprentice. Krell was long dead, Maul and Savage were killed on Mandalore, and Skywalker wasn't ready to be turned yet. There was no one for him to turn to, so he made a move that would disrespect his Sith ancestors, going to Tatooine to make an alliance with the Hutts and other crime families. Sidious knew if he could turn the criminal empires into a third faction, he could unite them into a third faction in the Clone Wars. It was his only out. If he could turn the focus on the peace treaties into a three-part war, then he could prolong it just enough to get the Jedi into the Republic War Machine. He was just pushing for his one chance to get rid of the Jedi and swoop in to take control over the Republic before it was lost. Due to Mace, Kenobi, and Obo being on Araxis, Plo decided to track the Chancellor's secret vessel to Tatooine. Because the war had gone on for so long, the Jedi sent individuals undercover inside of Senate Guard uniforms to see what else Palpatine had inside of his home. They found a garage full of secret vessels and artifacts, and they put trackers on all the vessels. This included the one that he used to go to Tatooine. The reason they didn't go after the artifacts is because no one in the galaxy would care or know who the Sith were, so it didn't really matter. Plo landed far away from Sidious to avoid detection. He found it odd that someone like him would go out this far into the galaxy. As he traversed the sands, Plo stopped and looked across the seas to see a shadowy figure staring at him. This wasn't the Chancellor, it was the Sith Lord. Plo ignited his weapon, and from across the sands, Sidious did too. The two of them sped towards each other and met up in the middle, their blades moving at the speed of light and then grinding to a stop in the middle, each using their physical strength against the other. Plo's dominant strength pushed Sidious back as they backed apart. Sidious, using his speed and ferocity, raised his hand and threw lightning at the Jedi Master, who leapt over it, landing behind him. Plo channeled the Force, trusting it to guide him. In a moment of solidarity with it, he threw his hand forward and channeled the most powerful array of electric judgment that he could and the Sith Lord was vanquished from existence. Plo had done it. Grandmaster versus Sith Lord. He defeated the last of the Sith, but the war was not over. Plo didn't know how to reveal the nature of this to anyone other than the Jedi. Was he supposed to inform the Senate? He thought not. At this point, he believed it was time for the Jedi to separate from the Republic. If they allowed a Sith Lord to return from the dead and become Chancellor, then it was a sign that the times, despite the Sith being gone again, had changed. Plo didn't want to risk any more public relations with the Sith in favor of political allegiance. When he returned to Coruscant, he provided proof that the Chancellor was a Sith Lord. He then informed the Council that he would like to backtrack away from Coruscant. The planet may have been their home for generations, but the Republic was not where they needed to be. Some of the Council believed this to be an overreaction, which he agreed to their notions, but the Jedi needed a fresh start. They needed to be there for everyone in the galaxy. There is no saying what would happen when the peace treaty was finalized, but according to Logs and Palpatine's vessel, he was going to try and unite the crime families, the ones Kenobi and Windu broke apart on Mandalore. If the order was to remain effective, then they needed more than just Coruscant. They needed more than just a home here with the politicians of the galaxy. The council had put it to a vote, not just among themselves, but their order. Every detail had been revealed. The fact that Palpatine was a Sith and Dooku was serving him, Every last tidbit of information was in the hands of the Jedi. They too couldn't believe it, but it made sense. Everyone finally understood why the war felt like it specifically out of the Jedi. The Order voted to move away from Coruscant, and as their vote went through, the galaxy was divided. Instead of the peace treaty reunifying the Republic, it was a galactic divorce. It came peacefully, but both the CIS and Republic believed their galaxy was too large for one system of government. The belief is 
that it would be beneficial to have competing systems of governments, not for the purpose of rivalries but their citizens. Instead of playing by the old rules and allowing old heads to drive their governments into the ground like Palpatine and Dooku, they would seek to help their citizens. After war, it was easier to see, and the future might not be. Plus, the Outer Rim needed help. The competition became who could save these worlds and bring them into either the Confederacy or the Republic. This competition brought a new level of prosperity to the Outer Rim immediately. The crime leaders were dealt with, and people finally had their saving grace. As for the Jedi, they would find home on Tenu. It was an old temple located in a gorgeous jungle. It'd be a place for the Order to reconnect with the Force, and then from there, the galaxy. Plo changed some of the rules around, with the assistance of the Council. This included M count and age restrictions for new Jedi, but there would be no change for the attachment rule, because there wasn't anything wrong with it. The idea in theory is that one wouldn't sacrifice a group of people over one person they were attached to. The Jedi had to care for everyone, and they couldn't let their personal attachments get in the way of that. The rule was for Jedi that couldn't control their attachments, and allowed their attachments to cloud their vision. Speaking of, Anakin vanished from the Order after Ahsoka's training was complete. He didn't want to be away from Padme, and decided that he would go to Coruscant to live his life with her. It wasn't a big deal to anyone, no one had any hard feelings about it, and Anakin never made any issue with anyone for it. He simply wanted different things, and Tanu was too far away from Coruscant for him. The closest people to him understood his decisions. Plo would have never had really any issue with this, but Anakin never thought of actually talking about it, so there was no one to dissuade him from leaving. Plo's leadership would continue to inspire generations, and he would remain Grand Master for another 10 years, deciding that the role of Grand Master should be changed within the span of 12 to 15 years. He didn't want the role to become complacent, or lifetime, as Yoda had made it. This too went for Master of the Order, but because the role was so focused on the Order as a whole, one could remain for 25 years. These changes would be instrumental in the future of the Order, because as the Jedi continued moving forward, adding thousands of new members every year and expanding outwards, the role of Grand Master became one of three roles. The Jedi needed new temples, they needed new locations, and they found them. As the Order grew, the mythos of the Grand Master who brought this era upon them would also grow. Plo became mysticized, because this was an era of light, an era in which the Jedi, because of him, would truly be defenders of peace and justice in the galaxy. And that, my friends, is our Grand Tier Request story. Again, special thanks to Benjamin Wells, Django Fett Clone, Ben Ingram, The Big Red Pure Mark, Diamond Constant, Darth Nemesis, Lord Tib, CC2024, Galvin Gaming, Tristan Mandalore, Sir William1767, Darth Revan, Grandity Bane, Laliant, Sky Guy, Penguin, Cullen Rooney, Shark Midori, RJ38, Nick, Michael Erlanger, The Last Jedi, Apollo, We Was Yosemite, Annika Stank Runner, CT7567, Toaster Oven, Oz of Oz, Darth Knox, The Eternal Padawan, Joshua Tem, Johnny Daguin, Sith Skeleton, Jedi Sloth, Mr. Yeet Gamer, Lord Tally, Gun Lee 66, Mad Men Studios, Anakin 003, Lord Draken, Forest League Star Wars, Airbus, Rex Wolf, Manthe First Names, Dark Saint 46, Baron Joshua, and the Denwing for supporting the channel. Smash that like button. Swimming other ways, could check out the Patreon. Cool things on there. There's gonna be something cool on Monday or Tuesday. Super excited. Anyways, let's talk about this story. So I felt like with Plo. It has to be a more so political talk. Being Grandmaster isn't just being a leader for the Jedi in this era. We saw in the Ugwe video that Ugwe didn't relate to Yoda because his order wasn't political. And so that's what I wanted this to be because in this era the Jedi are very much so political and they're intertwined with the Republic and so it has to be that. Uh, Anakin doesn't really have any place in the story truthfully. He just doesn't really fit in because he would opt to be in the war. Even if the Jedi claimed neutrality, he would be like, I want to fight. So the tension remains between the Council and the Separatists and the Republic, and the fight between them and trying to get peace with the two Sith Lords. So I hope you all enjoyed. I love you all. Spread the love. And always remember, my friends, may the Force be with you.